today's talk. Uh, today's talk is about Kubernetes secrets. Uh, it's called Base64 is not encryption or a better story for Kubernetes secrets. Um, there's kind of three parts to this talk. Um, we're going to talk about the Kubernetes defaults. Then we'll talk about some of the improvements uh, in Kubernetes that have been made over the past couple of uh, iterations and how you can improve the, the safety and security of Kubernetes secrets uh, should you choose to use them. Um, my name is Seth. Uh, I work on the developer relations team at Google. I'm an engineer by trade. I've been at Google about two years now. Um, prior to that, I worked at HashiCorp and prior to that, I worked at uh, Chef Software. So I've been involved in kind of the DevOps and security space for uh, about nine years now. Um, and I kind of live at the intersection of the two. Um, so talking a lot about CICD, but also talking a lot about security and, and practical security. Um, and before we get too far into the talk, I want to zoom out a little bit and answer a very important question, which is what is a secret? Um, many of you may have a different definition or a different understanding of, of what a secret is. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, a secret is a credential, a configuration, an API key, or some other piece of information that an application or service needs to consume at build time or runtime. Um, specifically, you know, you may have a Twitter API key because you need to tweet something. You may have a TLS certificate, a private key, public key, para because you need to secure communications. Um, this is what we're talking about with respect to a secret, specifically like an application secret or an infrastructure secret. Um, there are other things which you may consider secret. Um, for example, if you are in um, uh, the healthcare business, or if you are working for the government, you may have additional types of data that are classified as secret, right? Patient healthcare data or uh, top secret information might be considered secret, but in general, these are more generic secrets. Uh, why do we care? Like, why don't we just use Twitter as our secret storage? Why don't you just put all your passwords in a public GitHub gist? Why do we even care about protecting these things? Well, Secrets are a very attractive target for hackers uh, or attackers um, because they typically include uh, overly broad permissions and they're often leaked in you know, public repositories or storage buckets very easily. Um, especially if you're in a small company, oftentimes you just give everyone admin permission uh, because that's easier. You don't have time to sit down and model a permissions, uh, a permissions model for your organization. Uh, and even in larger companies, sometimes it's easier just to, you know, give everyone admin permission because I don't want to worry about, you know, filing a ticket to get Joe some extra privilege on this day uh, because he's on call. And more often than not, our secrets are often stored on disk or in places that, that are easily leaked. Um, I have leaked my own credentials multiple times um, by publishing my dot files on GitHub. I thought I was being helpful to people saying like, hey, look, here's the dot files I use. Check out my Vim configuration. And here I also leaked my GitHub token and my Heroku token. And people were able to access my private GitHub repos and uh, deploy applications onto Heroku on my behalf. Um, it was very nice of them. Um, but secrets are, are a critical point in any application's journey, right? Whether you need secrets in development to access a staging database to test your code or production secrets to communicate between microservices. We saw uh, some talks earlier today about Istio and using MTLS or mutual TLS where we're validating both client and server side certificates. Whether you're communicating with third party APIs like Twitter or Twilio that require API keys, or if you're communicating with a cloud provider where you need service accounts or access key pairs, all of these are secrets and we have to protect them um, and they're required. They're vital uh, for our applications to function. And there are um, kind of four key ways in which you can protect secrets. Um, the first is auditing. Um, this is actually not a way to really protect secrets, but rather respond in the event of a breach. So verify and log the use of every individual secret in a system, preferably in some centralized system. So whatever you're using for logging today, you should create a separate sync. And anytime someone accesses a secret, you should be generating a log entry or an audit trail for that secret. Um, so whether that's Splunk or Stackdriver or the Elk Stack, you should be generating those logs. And the reason for that is that in the event of a data breach, um, we do our best to protect secrets, but a true, a truly uh, verbose threat model, a really good threat model also takes into account what happens when there's a breach. Um, so having that data to be able to know if a secret was accessed improperly or, or outside of the right bounds is important. And that's why we have to audit. 
The second way we protect secrets is via encryption. Uh, I think most people are familiar with encryption. Um, you should always encrypt your secrets uh, at, at two different layers. The first is at the actual secret layer itself, which you're going to encrypt it at storage, but then also in transit uh, when you're communicating over the network. It does you no good to encrypt your secrets on disk if you're just going to send them over the internet in plain text and you know the coffee shop Wi-Fi or anyone in the office can listen and intercept those connections. So we need to be encrypting secrets both in transit with something like TLS and at rest with something like an AES cipher uh, or like a you know whatever cipher is approved here using your organization. The third way we protect secrets is by limiting their lifetime. Um, we want to rotate secrets very, very frequently uh, as much as the applications and services allow. Changing a secret regularly or in the case of a suspected compromise reduces our surface area for an attack. Uh, if we take like the most generic brute force attack, um, you know, with cloud computing today uh, and the way that GPUs are moving, it's very feasible for an attacker to spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars on a very beefy GPU core instance and brute force, um, you know, a 20 to 30 character password or API key. Um, so make sure that you're continuously rotating those to protect against brute force attacks, to protect against timing attacks. Um, but also by rotating your passwords frequently, you get in the habit and you start to build applications that respond to rotation well. Um, this wasn't true really five or 10 years ago. Oftentimes in order to rotate, say for example, a database credential or an API key, it involved downtime. You had to take the application offline, you had to update a configuration file, or sometimes even deploy new code changes, which might involve you know branching and merging. Um, and we didn't have a really good way to programmatically update secrets. Um, and tools like Kubernetes came along and gave us a really solid API in which to access secrets so we can update them out of the band of our application deployment. We can update a secret, without completely redeploying the application. And this is really great because it allows us to rotate secrets more regularly. We don't have to wait, you know, if we only deploy our monolithic application every, um, you know, two to three months, we don't have to wait two to three months to rotate secrets. We can rotate them more frequently. And it helps us build better software that's more resilient. Um, and the fourth thing, um, very closely coupled to encryption, is isolation. We need to separate where secrets are stored from where they're accessed, or separate where secrets are managed from where they're being accessed. Um, that way, attackers need to compromise multiple systems in order to escalate privilege in the system. So these are four of, I would say, the most common ways in which we can protect or identify secrets uh, in a distributed system or microservices or service-oriented architecture. Uh, and the one I want to zoom in specifically today when talking about Kubernetes is encryption. Um, and again, we should always encrypt our secrets in two places. We should be encrypting them in transit while they're moving between systems, and we should be encrypting them at rest when they're stored on disk uh, or in memory or in the file system. And there's different layers of encryption, uh, ranging from kind of specific, uh, specificity to levels of integration. Um, you might be familiar with machine level encryption. For example, if you have an Apple device, an Apple laptop, you might be using something like FileVault, which is uh, full disk encryption. There's kind of one key that encrypts the entire hard drive, and that key is stored in your keychain, and when you enter your password, it you know decrypts the hard drive and you can access the data. Uh, on Windows, uh, I think this is called BitLocker. Um, it's just, basically, you can think of it as there's a string and all of the data on that hard drive is encrypted with a string. That means that if someone were to like walk up to your laptop and yank out the hard drive, all of the data Data, then that hard drive is encrypted uh, and they can't access the plain text without knowing that key or brute forcing it. But as we move kind of up the stack, we can get into things like service level encryption and application layer encryption. Um, and this is where instead of having one key that encrypts the entire hard drive, each piece of data is encrypted with its own key. So when an attacker steals that hard drive or gains access to that data, um, particularly if the hard drive is already unlocked, if it's already been decrypted or is in a decrypted state, they have to brute force each of those pieces of data. And each of those pieces of data are encrypted with different keys. So this greatly improves your security posture because it prevents an attacker from just kind of having access to everything from a single key. But it also increases the amount of work that you as a developer have to do because now you have to manage all of these keys. Or do you? So application layer encryption is uh, today applied at the earliest possible step in a service-oriented architecture. So application layer encryption would occur inside your application. Say a user gives you their credit card and you need to store that your application would encrypt their credit card data before sending it to the database, before sending it to any other service. 
And because it's applied at the earliest possible step, it also gives us the most granular protection currently available. Your application, your service, can generate a new encryption key for each credit card number. So instead of having all the credit card numbers uh, encrypted with the same key in the database, each credit card number is encrypted with a different key in the database. That way, if an attacker gains access to our database or an attacker gains access to, say, a backup of our database, they don't have the plain text credit card data, and better, if they are able to brute force the first key, that key does not also decrypt the second credit card number and the third credit card number, right? It's a very expensive operation to try to gain that information to the point where an attacker might be deterred because there's probably an easier path to get that information. And more importantly, it protects data as it moves throughout the system. So you may not recognize, especially in a large enterprise, all of the various consumers of your service. So by encrypting the data before it leaves your application, you're reducing the chances of someone accidentally leaking that credential, uh, whether that's internally, right? There's been a number of issues. Twitter just had a, a blog post they released a few months ago where they were accidentally logging passwords in plain text. Uh, and that wasn't because they weren't encrypting the passwords, or maybe this was Facebook. It was one of the social media sites, but they, they were still encrypting your password. In fact, they were encrypting your password with, with Bcrypt, but before they did that, they were logging it to a system. Uh, and because they logged to a third-party system outside of their application domain before encrypting the data, it was available in plain text in those logs. So by applying application layer encryption at the earliest possible step, it helps protect the data as it moves throughout the system, whether it's intentional or unintentional. So you might often hear this phrase, um, DID, which refers to defense in depth. It's this idea that uh, security is not a binary switch. Security is not on or off. Instead, we have threat models, very similar to how in medieval times, the kings and the queens had castles and fortresses. And the castles and fortresses were protected with a number of different elements. They were protected with often a moat, with a drawbridge. They were protected with stairs and guards. They were protected with different types of weapons like knives and swords and bows and arrows and to get to uh, kind of the king or the queen of the castle often involved going through all of these defenses and as you got closer to the the center the the more rigorous the defenses became uh, and this is what we mean when we say about defense in depth so when we're talking about secrets management and we're talking about security we want to design for defense in depth so we want to leverage application layer encryption and file system encryption, or we want to leverage application layer encryption and machine level encryption, coupled with things like TLS. It's not just, you know, oh, we're doing this, so we're secure. Security is not binary. Uh, it's not on or off. It is a scale, and there are certain applications that require more security than others. Uh, and it's a, a, a good exercise for your organization to develop a threat model and decide what needs to be secure and how secure does it need to be. So with that, let's talk about Kubernetes. Um, as indicated by my four sad faces, the Kubernetes defaults are pretty sad with respect to how Kubernetes handles secrets. Um, in fact, they don't. Um, secrets in Kubernetes are stored in plain text by default. Um, if you have spun up your own Kubernetes cluster using something like kubeadmin, or as we'll see in a bit with my demo on Minikube, um, the Kubernetes secrets in etcd, which is the backing store for Kubernetes, it's kind of like the file system of Kubernetes, those are in plain text. And anyone with access to etcd or a backup of etcd has access to those secrets in plain text. Now, before I continue, I do want to note that if you're using a cloud provider, maybe you're using like uh, Google Kubernetes Engine or Azure uh, Kubernetes Service or EKS, um, those providers uh, do add additional layers of protection. And as we'll see, it's possible for you if you're running your own Kubernetes uh, or if you're you know running your own Kubernetes cluster, you can add those additional layers of protection. But um, if you're not using a cloud provider and you're just spinning up like the default uh, Kubernetes using kubeadmin, this is the state of the world. So let me walk you through some visual diagrams of what this looks like. So we'll use that same credit card from earlier. This is just an example. This is any piece of secret data. The user has given you your credit card, uh, their credit card, and they need you need to store it in your database for, um, I don't know, credit. You need to perform a checkout later. Or maybe it's a subscription service, so you need to bill them every month. So how does this look? Well, the user gives you their credit card, so they fill out a form, they click submit. That then hits your service, um, and you want to create a Kubernetes secret out of that credit card so that you can access it later. So that piece of secret data hits the Kubernetes API server. The Kubernetes API server sees the data in plain text. The Kubernetes API server then Base64 encodes that data and writes it to etcd. Um, 
It's important to note that this data is encoded, not encrypted. Uh, it is encoded so that you can supply binary data or non-string data, but it is not encrypted, meaning an attacker, which we will represent via this red raccoon in all future slides, if an attacker has access to etcd or a backup of etcd, they have access to the plain text secret. Um, and I have developed a word for this that I think you all will like, which is called encryption. Um, encryption is uh, whenever you confuse uh, encoding and encryption. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, no one would ever actually do this. Like no one would ever run uh, Kubernetes and put secrets in plain text and etcd. And even if they did that, they would definitely not make their etcd cluster publicly available for anyone to access. Um, I encourage you all to check out Snowden, which is a service that kind of, you can think of it as like searching the internet for open ports. Um, and just look for some of the publicly exposed etcd servers out there. Now, etcd is used for more than just Kubernetes. Um, it is in and of itself a distributed key value store and consensus building algorithm and kind of the baseline of a number of different tools. But you would be surprised what you can find checking out uh, Shodan and searching for etcd. But just to show you exactly how insecure the Kubernetes defaults are, I'd like to jump over to a demo really quick. So on my local laptop here, I'm running um, something. There we are. All right, on my local laptop, I'm running um, Minikube locally. So I actually have two Minikube clusters, um, one with uh, a Kubernetes 1.10 feature enabled and one without. So let's check out the one with the feature disabled first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a Kubernetes secret. Oh, the timer is in my face. Okay, I'm gonna create a Kubernetes secret. So this is the command that I'm gonna be running. It's just kubectl create a secret name demo and I'm giving it a username and a password. So this is my username is Seth Vargo and my password is super secret. That's my password to everything, so please don't uh, use it. Um, I've already claimed it and passwords are uh, unique. Cool, so I've run this command. I've created that secret in uh, Minikube, which again is running locally on my, my laptop. Now I wanna access that. So I'll show you the script that I wrote for that. Um, and honestly, the reason that I wrote scripts is because as you can see, I'm terrible at typing and talking at the same time. So uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to uh, run kubectl exec. So I'm, you can think of this as like SSHing or connecting to the Kubernetes pod. In particular, I'm connecting to the one that's running etcd. And then I'm gonna query etcd for registry secret default demo. Uh, so etcd is kind of like a key value store. It has a file system like hierarchy, and that happens to be where uh, the secrets are stored. And I know this because uh, it's publicly available information, and you can also like enumerate this information if you don't know the exact path. So let me go ahead and run that. And you'll notice that we get back, pull this up a little bit. You'll notice that we get back um, the username and password in plain text. Now, there is some data in here that is not plain text, uh, and it comes out in a little bit weird of a format, but you can see that right here, the secret password is available uh, in plain text, and the username, Seth Vargo, is available in plain text. And it's important to note that this etcd server happened to be online, meaning it was accessible, I could kubectl exec into it, but even if an attacker had access to a backup of etcd, a file system backup that you put on something like Google Cloud Storage or S3 for resiliency purposes, they could grab that backup, start any etcd cluster with that backup, and they would have access to this data. So not only are we vulnerable to an online attack, but we're also vulnerable to an offline attack. And this includes every secret in our Kubernetes cluster. So what can we do about it? Well, before we move on, I want to talk about this concept called envelope encryption. How many people are familiar with envelope encryption? It doesn't matter. I can't see you. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about envelope encryption. Uh, in order to do envelope encryption, we need three pieces of data. We need the secret, which we'll just call data, uh, represented by the credit card number. We need a data encryption key which is just any old key, you can think of it as a string, and that's gonna be represented in red. And then we need a key encryption key, which is again, just any old string that's represented in green. And let me show you how this works through a series of carefully crafted animations that I hope will impress you. So we have our piece of secret data and we generate a data encryption key. Again, that's the red key. 
We can use any system level library like OpenSSL or most languages support creating a key on the fly. And we use that key to encrypt our piece of data. So we have a new key. Each time we get data, we generate a new key. And each time we get a secret, we encrypt it with that secret. Then we have a key encryption key, which is represented by the green key on the screen. That key generally lives in some third party system like a key management service. Uh, and it generally doesn't, you know, this key already exists. You're not creating it on the fly. We use that key to encrypt the data encryption key. And now we have two pieces of encrypted data. We have the credit card or the secret, which is encrypted with the data encryption key. And then we have the encrypted data encryption key, which is encrypted with the key encryption key. We then put those two pieces of data together in our storage backend, database, file system, S3, whatever it might be. So now we have an encrypted key and a piece of encrypted data stored side by side in a storage backend. When we want to reverse this process, when we want that plain text secret back, we split them apart. That's very easy to do because we know the length of both of them. We split them apart and we reverse the process. We use the key encryption key to encrypt the data encryption key. And then we decrypt the data encryption key, or we use the data encryption key to, encrypt, to decrypt the data, which gives us back the plain text. So it's just the reverse of that process. Now, every time we get a new piece of data, we generate a new data encryption key. So if you were to look in your kind of a three-dimensional model of all your secrets in your organization, every single secret would be encrypted with a different key. They would have their own data encryption key. But then if you were to zoom out a little bit more, you're leveraging something like a key management service, like you know Amazon KMS, Azure KMS, Google KMS, your own KMS, that has far less keys. And you're rotating those keys on some fixed interval, like every 30 days, every 90 days, or in the event of a suspected data breach. So there are some really key advantages and benefits to envelope encryption, particularly around scale. So as I said, we want to generate a new data encryption key for each data entry. So that means that every piece of your data has its own encryption key. If an attacker brute forces one encryption key, that uh, encryption key does not decrypt other data. This, but at the same time, even though we have hundreds of thousands of keys across our hundreds of thousands of secrets, they're tied back into a central key management system. So we can revoke one of the parent keys, one of the green keys, one of the key encryption keys, and effectively render all of that data irrecoverable. We've effectively crypto shredded, making it irrecoverable, irrecoverable by traditional means. We rotate our key encryption keys on a time-based interval, and we rotate our data encryption keys every time new data arrives. And this gives us a really solid threat model. It prevents an attacker from just brute forcing our keys, but it also has a really low management overhead. It allows us to rotate and version our keys independently of our data. So what does this have to do with Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes 1.7 actually introduced envelope encryption into the secrets envelope provider. So all of that background was important because it's not gonna make sense for the rest of the talk. So Kubernetes 1.7 introduced this concept of envelope encryption, and it works uh, like this. So as a Kubernetes administrator, you create this YAML file um, because we're all YAML engineers now. Um, I like that someone quoted like the Beyonce song. It's like, if you liked it, you should have written it in YAML instead of feel like you should have put a ring on it. Um, that might have been an American joke. I don't know, but some of you left. So anyway, so we create this thing called an encryption configuration. Um, and you're specifying what you want Kubernetes to encrypt, in this case, secrets. It's actually possible to encrypt more than secrets. You could actually encrypt pretty much any object. Doesn't really make sense to do it for other than secrets or config maps, but you could do it for any other object. And then you specify a secrets provider, which is a pluggable provider. Uh, and in this case, I have two providers, AES CBC, which is an AES 256-bit CBC algorithm, and Secret Box, which is a more um, modern algorithm that's a little bit more performant, but less approved in kind of enterprises and governments. Um, and then in this encryption provider configuration, I have my keys specified as an array. So that is a base64 encoded uh, encryption key that I generated with OpenSSL. Both of them are, um, all three of them are. 
And what will happen is Kubernetes will try these providers in order. So whenever a new secret comes in in plain text, it will use the uh, first key in that list to encrypt the data. But whenever it tries to decrypt data, it'll iterate through all of them and try to find the one that decrypts successfully. So this helps you kind of rotate keys over time. Um, you don't have to re-encrypt everything, but all of the new data always gets encrypted with the latest version. And then whenever you start or restart the Kubernetes API server, you pass in this additional flag, dash dash encryption dash provider dash config, and you give it the path to that YAML file, uh, as well as any other options that you start your configuration with. So what does this look like graphically? So same diagram as before, but now we have the encryption configuration sitting between the Kubernetes API server and etcd. The plain text data, again, hits the Kubernetes API server. The Kubernetes API server then delegates to the encryption configuration. The encryption configuration encrypts that data using the first key in that list, and then writes the encrypted data to etcd. So now, if an attacker gains access to etcd, or an offline backup of etcd, they don't have the plain text data, because they don't actually have the keys. The keys live in the encryption configuration. So even if our etcd server is publicly exposed, which I'm not recommending you do, but if it's publicly exposed, an attacker doesn't have access to the plain text secrets. They have access to the encrypted secrets. And when we go the other direction, we get the plain text back. So as an application developer, you don't have to worry about encrypting and decrypting data. You still use the Kubernetes API server the same way you normally would. Your app is actually oblivious to the idea that encryption is happening. But to an attacker, we've greatly increased the hurdles that they have to overcome in order to access your plain text secrets. Or have we? So if an attacker has access to an etcd server that's online or an etcd backup, we've, we've improved your security posture. But we've only improved it nominally. Because if an attacker has access to the virtual machine on which the Kubernetes master is running, or a backup of the file system on which the Kubernetes master is running, there's one key drawback that I hope some of you have picked up on. So <clears throat> the first drawback is that you have to generate those keys yourselves. You must know the magical incantation and order of all of the magical OpenSSL commands that you must run in order to generate keys. Um, Stack Overflow can help, but it's kind of annoying. Second, key management is your responsibility. When you change that uh, YAML file, the encryption configuration, you must add a new key, you must save that file onto the system, so you're probably using something like configuration management, chef puppet, chef puppet Ansible, or Salt uh, to, to configure that. You must then restart the Kubernetes API server. So if you restart the Kubernetes API server, you might have a little bit of downtime because during that time, you can't schedule or uh, the orchestrator and the, the kubelet aren't running or they're not responding. Um, if you work in a larger enterprise or a highly regulated industry, another key drawback is that there's no HSM integrations. So if you rely on like a hardware security module to generate entropy and to generate keys or to act as a root of trust. There's no way to integrate with that using the encryption provider configuration. But I hope that some of you picked up on the largest drawback of all, which is that the underlying encryption keys are still stored in plain text on the file system. So all you've done is given an attacker an incredible laugh. Like you have made their day uh, because you tried so hard. Um, but the keys that encrypt that data live alongside the data itself. And this violates the earlier principle that we talked about with isolation. The keys should be stored separately from the data because attackers then have to compromise multiple systems. So in this case, if an attacker has access to that master VM, they have access to the encryption keys. You haven't actually improved your security posture at all. So let's talk about Kubernetes 1.10. So Kubernetes 1.10 took the 1.7 uh, in envelope encryption a step further and allows for pluggable key management service encryption providers. This is a plugin based system that allows third parties like cloud providers, like HashiCorp Vault, like CyberArk to act as a key management service on behalf of Kubernetes. Still need to write that encryption configuration file. But notice that there's no keys in this encryption configuration file. Instead, we have a Unix socket. We also have a cache size, which is just uh, an implementation detail. But we have the endpoint, which is a Unix socket or an HTTP payload endpoint, where our KMS plugin lives. And this plugin, as its name implies, is pluggable. You can write your own. So what does this look like? 
Well, we introduce another component into our, our diagram, into our world. We introduce this KMS provider, which provides the green keys and provides the key encryption keys. So we have a piece of data that hits the Kubernetes API server. The Kubernetes API server delegates the encryption configuration, but the encryption configuration doesn't have any keys. So how does it encrypt data? Well, it actually delegates that encryption responsibility to the third-party KMS provider. The KMS provider then returns the encrypted data, and the encrypted data is written to etcd. When we reverse the process, it's exactly the opposite. The encrypted data goes to the encryption configuration. The encryption configuration says, this is encrypted. I'm going to give this data to KMS. The KMS is going to decrypt the data, give back the plain text, and the plain text is then returned to the user. So now, if an attacker has access to the master node, uh, whether that's like physical access or access to a backup, they actually don't have access to the underlying keys. They have access to the encrypted data, and they have access to make API calls to the KMS provider. Um, but if you've secured your Unix socket permissions, and if you're leveraging like cloud provider authentications, like IAM authentication, they actually might not have that permission. So you can tighten this down as much as possible. Um, so we've greatly improved our security posture. Um, over the original uh, zero encryption. And we've marginally improved our security posture over using the keys on disk by leveraging this third party provider. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, this looks really hard. Like, I don't want to write that pl like plugin for myself. Well, the good news is that most of the major cloud providers already offer a plugin that is either written by them or written by the community. Um, and it's actually not that hard to write your own. I already wrote my own just to see what it was like so that I could make that statement. It took me about six hours of work, and that included writing tests. Um, so if you don't write tests, you're probably in like three hours of work. You should write tests, but just saying. Um, there are existing plugins on GitHub, so you don't have to write this yourself. Uh, on Google Cloud, there's the Kubernetes Cloud KMS plugin. Azure has the Kubernetes Desk KMS plugin. Um, the uh, Kubernetes SIGs have created an AWS encryption provider plugin. Uh, and Oracle has actually created one for HashiCorp Vault, uh, which we'll check out in a little bit. Um, Rather shameful plug because I work for Google and they paid me to be here. Um, if you're working on GKE, which is the Google Kubernetes engine, you can actually do all of this with a flag. You don't have to manage YAML at all. We've replaced uh, YAML with command line flags. Um, you can specify the encryption key that you want when you create your cluster, or you can add this to an existing cluster, and all of it's managed for you. Um, so you just specify the KMS key, and then um, all of the data is in encrypted and decrypted automatically. It's very transparent to you and your applications. So a question I often get um, is, how do you solve the initial seeker problem? Like, in order for Kubernetes to talk to the third-party KMS provider, it needs some authentication. It needs a token, an API key, a service account. How on earth do you authenticate the KMS provider and not reduce your threat model? How do you, how do you authenticate the KMS provider without dramatically decreasing the security? Because if we just hard code the API key on the master VM, then the attacker can just call the KMS provider for us. It's the same as the Kubernetes 1.7 implementation. Um, how can we do this? Well, this is where using IAM, identity and access management, as uh, given by a cloud provider, can really help. Um, by rooting your level of trust in the cloud provider, we can delegate privilege and access management to the cloud provider's IAM, and then we separate concerns as much as possible. So for example, the nodes or the physical VMs that are running at CD don't need IAM permissions to talk to KMS because the Kubernetes API server does that. At CD doesn't need permission to talk to KMS, and it shouldn't have permission to talk to KMS. Additionally, depending on your cloud provider's architecture, you may be able to restrict, restrict requests based off of like the signed payloads and make sure that only signed payloads that uh, can actually run in your cluster, meaning that if an attacker is able to get SSH access and they try to make that outbound request, that's not a signed request, and they don't have the ability to sign that because it's actually bundled in the application. Right? So there's a lot of ways to prevent even an attacker who has like root access on the system from being able to communicate with that third-party KMS provider. But on top of all of that, even if an attacker is able to communicate with that third party KMS, you've still increased your security. Because if we recall to the earlier slide, another key piece is auditing. 
And if all of a sudden your audit logs show that there's like a hundred thousand requests per second to the KMS key, you can disable or destroy that KMS key independently of the application or service. And now an attacker can't do an offline backup. If that key is not accessible to them because you've either revoked permission or because you've destroyed the key, the data is effectively irrecoverable. You've effectively crypto shredded the data. Um, and this is important because um, an attacker who has online access to the KMS key and, you know, let's say you messed up the permissions or you couldn't properly secure it, like that's bad. But you can react to that because you can disable the key or just temporarily disable access to the key. And now an attacker can't decrypt that data. They can't do an offline attack. So from that perspective, we've increased our security. Uh, someone with a backup of our VM, for example, they can't just decrypt that data because they need access to the key. And there's ways that you can restrict access to the key, you know, within your project, within your region, within your IRN, whatever cloud provider you're using, they have ways to restrict VMs, you know, from just running anywhere. They have to be signed, they have to be authenticated uh, with the metadata servers. But I started this talk saying by like, if you're on a cloud provider, this might not be a problem for you. Um, so for example, on like Google Cloud, even before we offered application layer encryption, all of your etcd data was already encrypted. We just gave you the ability to manage the key now. Um, and on other cloud providers, that's the same might be true. Your data might already be encrypted or you might not have control. You might not have the ability to set an encryption configuration. Um, <clears throat> and I said that this talk is mostly for people who are spinning up their own Kubernetes servers using something like Kubeadmin or, you know, running local with Minikube, how can you improve your integrity there? And you could leverage a cloud provider's KMS service to do that. Uh, every major cloud provider has some key management service. They're billed very, very little. Um, you can make hundreds of thousands of requests for like $10 a month. Um, so it's very, very low cost in order to adopt one of these. But if you're running on premise, the reason that you're running on premise is likely because you don't trust a cloud provider or because you don't want to eat the network latency or the overhead of doing so, uh, or your company just doesn't let you use the cloud. So what do you do in that case? How can you leverage an external KMS provider if you can't leverage the cloud? Um, and this is where uh, like the, the open source tool HashGrip Vault comes in. So you saw on one of the earlier slides, one of the GitHub plugins that Oracle developed was actually for HashGrip Vault. And HashiCorp Vault has a number of different secrets engines and plugins and functionality that I won't go into for sake of time. But one of the key things that it has is a key management service. Um, it is called Transit, which uh, refers to the fact that data is encrypted in transit and decrypted in transit. And it can act as a KMS provider. So you can run HashiCorp Vault, or if you're already leveraging HashiCorp Vault for other applications and services, you can enable this secrets engine and you get all of the functionality. So all we do is replace the third party KMS provider with HashiCorp Vault's transit backend. So just in this example, you're running Vault on premise inside your own data center or inside your own network, and you're leveraging its transit backend to act as that third party key management service provider. Uh, and all of the data is encrypted and decrypted the same way. And to show you how that works and to also kind of mirror on-prem as much as possible, I could totally do a demo leveraging like Google Cloud KMS or Amazon KMS encrypting data in Kubernetes. But one, I don't trust conference Wi-Fi, even though I have to give a shout out to the organizers, this conference Wi-Fi is pretty good. Um, and two, I wanted to mirror on-prem as much as possible. So let me show you what this looks like and kind of bring it back to the demo I did earlier. So, um, I'm using Minikube again locally, which you should not use for production, but it works great for live demos. And I created the cluster earlier, which had no encryption configuration. And I created another cluster, which has encryption configuration that delegates authentication to that Oracle plugin for Vault that we had earlier. And I'm running a Vault cluster inside Minikube. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is show you the script that I'm going to create, create secret vault. So this is the exact same command as before. I'm just targeting a different cluster. So earlier the context was secrets dash default. Now I'm targeting secrets dash vault. So same exact script, same exact everything. If you don't believe me, um, I'll put them on top of one another. Um, so literally the same exact everything, except we're targeting a different cluster and that cluster has a different configuration. So let me go ahead and run that.
and I've created my secret. Um, and locally, you probably didn't observe much latency because the refresh rate on the projector is likely lower than the latency that you would have experienced anyway. Um, but in the real world scenario, you're talking about somewhere between 200 and 300 milliseconds latency round trip time, depending on the CPU that's available to something like vaults and the amount of entropy in the system. Um, <clears throat> cool. So we've created that secret. Now let's try to access it inside etcd. So um, bin access vault. So um, same script as before. Again, we're just targeting a different context. Running etcd cuddle get slash registry slash secret slash default slash demo. This is identical to the other script. We're just targeting a different cluster. But let's watch what happens when we do that. I know how computers work. Uh, access etcd vault. We get back this. Um, that's a lot of question marks, and that's because my terminal doesn't actually know how to represent most of those characters because they're actually um, coming back as like hex dump um, or you know non uh, ASCII representable characters. They're coming back as binary data. You'll notice there is some plain text data in here, so there's some information that we can ex extract. Um, this is just, I just print out the path. Um, but here you'll notice that there's kind of this prefix. There's Kates, which is short for Kubernetes, Encryption KMS V1 Vault. So this is an identifier. This kind of string here is an identifier which is telling us, hey, this particular secret was encrypted with a Kubernetes encryption provider for Vault at version one. Um, and this is less important to you as the end user, as the consumer. It's very important for Kubernetes because if you have multiple encryption providers, maybe you're using HashCorp Vault and a Cloud KMS provider, uh, Kubernetes needs to know which provider to delegate the decryption and encryption to. Um, so that's why that metadata is there. And then within here, there's this magical Z key. I don't know why, um, but it's present in all of them. I don't know. It's part of the implementation. Um, and then my key is the name of the key in HashiCorp Vault that encrypts this data. And that key is at version one. Um, so I can rotate that key independently of this data. Uh, and the data will be encrypted with the new key as I write it. But I can still decrypt it with the old key. And then everything after that. Um, is arbitrary metadata that Kubernetes uses, and then the question mark fancy Unicode characters, so everything from here on, is the secret. But that secret is encrypted with a key that's being managed by the third-party KMS provider. So if an attacker had access to this etcd backup, this is literally what they would see. If they had access to an online etcd server, this is literally what they would see. That's the demo I just showed you. So if you were to publicly expose your etcd server uh, and list it on Shodan, this is what an attacker would see, and this isn't very useful information. Now it's possible that they could like brute force this um, and, and get useful information, but by default, this is pretty useless to an attacker. But to my application, when my application requests a Kubernetes secret through the Kubernetes API, or if I mount a secret in my, uh, you know, my deployment or my replica set or my stateful set, when that secret is mounted, the Kubernetes API server automatically decrypts this value for me and gives it to my application in plain text. So my application doesn't have to change. And this is really the beauty of application layer encryption in Kubernetes, is that my applications themselves <clears throat> don't necessarily have to change to leverage application layer encryption. Um, that being said, if my applications are being um, reckless with their secrets, if they're just straight up like logging them and printing them out and debug messages everywhere, then obviously I haven't improved my security posture. But if my applications and services are you know, following best practices, they're running in production mode instead of debug mode, they're not logging things in plain text to the file system, I've greatly improved my security posture without changing my application's code. And I can rotate and manage my secrets outside of the lifecycle of uh, deploying and updating my applications. So to quickly summarize, Kubernetes 1.10 uh, is the version that you should be running, uh, or later. You should really be running 1.13 for security reasons and lots of other things, but 1.10 is what introduced this idea of a third-party KMS provider. And in this model, Kubernetes secrets are still an abstraction. They're still a transport layer. It's still the same API to your applications. But to the API server and to etcd, we're delegating encryption and decryption to a third-party KMS provider, something like Cloud KMS or HashiCorp Vault. So to quickly recap, and then uh, hopefully they'll have some questions, um, 
always use at least two layers of encryption. That might be something like app layer encryption and file system encryption. Uh, always encrypt uh, data in transit and at rest, right? You can do all of this, and then if you're just sending requests over HTTP, over the coffee shop Wi-Fi, uh, nothing matters, right? All of that data is now available to anyone on that network in plain text. Um, rotate your keys regularly. Um, rotate uh, your data encryption keys every time you have a new piece of data, um, and then rotate your key encryption keys on some fixed interval every 30 days, every 60 days, every 90 days. Um, leverage envelope encryption. Envelope encryption, even if you're not using Kubernetes, even if none of this is relevant to you, envelope encryption is a very scalable way to do encryption that provides us the ability to crypto shred by revoking a few keys for thousands of pieces of data, but it gives us unique encryption keys for all of those pieces of data. So it's a really scalable way to meet compliance needs, uh, and, and it's used widely in the industry. Um, and lastly, like use a third party KMS provider to predict Kubernetes secrets if you're running Kubernetes on prem. And if you're leveraging a cloud provider Kubernetes, like look at the documentation, look at the security hardening recommendations, see if there's a feature, uh, whether it's an alpha or beta or GA that you can enable that gives you the ability to encrypt those secrets with a key that you manage, um, instead of having the cloud provider manage that key to give you more control and flexibility to revoke access and monitor and log access. Um, and lastly, cause I didn't add it to the slide. Um, Enable auditing, like I glanced over it in the very beginning, I said it's a key thing, but we're gonna focus on encryption. But like in the event of a data breach, um, we, we can't spend too much time focusing on detection. We need to spend more time focusing on response, right? I see organizations make this mistake where they spend a ton of time and effort preventing an attack. And you should totally invest time and effort in pre preventing an attack. But if you spend 100% of your time preventing an attack, the moment an attacker gets in, and they will, because like there will be another CPU vulnerability this week, there will be another like graphics vulnerability next week, right? When that happens, when an attacker breaks your threat model, when they break into your fortress through a threat model that you didn't even consider, if you devoted 100% of your energy into preventing them from getting in, that means everything is on fire. Everyone's running around with the, like a chicken with their head cut off trying to prevent this. Whereas if you just devote 10% or 15% of your resources now to building a playbook, building automation, investing in chaos engineering for security, such that when a security event happens, there's a button, there's a script, there's a command, there's a playbook that a human can follow and keep a cool head, a level head in the event of a data breach or an attacker on the network, um, you will ultimately improve your security posture, right? Prevention is only one part of the, the puzzle. So with that, uh, thank you all very much. That's my Twitter handle. If you have questions, comments, complaints, or concerns, you can send them there. My DMs are also open. If you don't feel comfortable saying things publicly or asking a question now, you can always direct message me on Twitter. And I think we have some time for questions. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, okay. First one is about uh, Google KMS. Uh, so I saw on the slide uh, there was a region defined, uh, some U US East one or something. So does it, does it mean that uh, passwords uh, get uh, replicated across zones? So KMS keys live in a region. And when you're using... Um, Kubernetes, whether you're using a zonal cluster or a regional cluster, the key that you're encrypting the secrets with has to live in that region. Um, because if it doesn't, then you actually decrease your availability. Because if your key is in a different region and that region is down, now your cluster is also effectively down because you can't decrypt those secrets. So we don't replicate, uh, unless you choose the global region, we don't replicate KMS keys across regions. Um, they are replicated in every zone within that region. Uh, so it's possible to set uh, different regions so it gets uh, replicated in the different regions? Um, no, so it's either everywhere, which we call global, or in a region. But there's no way to say I want it in these three regions. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. And how security is handled in that case just to um, handle traffic between those regions um, or zones? So the way that uh, you would encrypt the data with like TLS, are you asking about the KMS key or the Kubernetes key? Sorry. Uh, KMS, Google KMS basically. 
Yeah. So your communication to KMS would be over TLS. Um, and then the replication that we do, we do that internally. So it's actually a data replication on the back end, um, which we do with our, our spanner database in the back end. Uh, okay. I think I understand. And the second one uh, is about uh, rotation. Uh, so as I understand, you need, you will need to re-encrypt again all the secrets uh, with a new key uh, when you rotate it. Is it so? No. So when you rotate a key, uh, this is a very good question because I, I get this a lot. When you rotate a key, you don't delete the old key um, unless like it's responding to a data breach. So when you rotate a key, you create a new version of the key, but the old key still lives. Um, sometimes this is called a key ring, where it's actually a collection of keys. So old secrets still get decrypted with the old key, but new secrets get encrypted with the new key. So over time, you'll have kind of a spread of secrets that are encrypted with different key encryption keys and different data encryption keys. Now, let's say you have a data breach or you know you have your security and compliance report coming up. There is a command you can run in Kubernetes that will like force Force update all of the secrets to use a new data encryption key and the latest key encryption key, at which point you can disable those old versions because they shouldn't be used anymore. Um, but when you rotate, you're not creating and deleting, you're creating a new one and updating the pointer to head, but the rest of the list still exists to be able to decrypt the data. Uh, so you need to keep an eye on uh, the keys, so you need to manually delete those when it got compromised. You can manually delete them. You can also set up policies like in the cloud provider that say like, um, so I'll give you a good example for Google because it's the one I'm most familiar with. Like every 30 days you could have a, um, a cloud scheduler function that invokes a script that just goes through, replaces, like updates all the Kubernetes secrets to the latest keys and disables all but latest. So you don't have to do it manually. Like you could automate it on some fixed interval. Um, but in the event of a data breach, you would probably want to do it in a manual way because the, uh, the breach is happening right there uh, or in a way that is like scripted, but a human is going to start the automation as opposed to being scheduled. Mm, I see. Thank you. Yep. I can't see. Is there? You want else? Okay. Then I have a question. Can I ask? Sure. <laughs> okay. I um, saw one slide that no I, uh, HSA model needed. Uh, is it uh, legally that uh, finance institutions can use this encryption and not use uh, HSA, HSM anymore? I, so, IHSM model. Do you know this? Um, so if for card encryption. Yeah. So if if you're using um, like Kubernetes one thirteen or later or one ten or later, um, and your hardware security module has the ability to um, expose an API, which not all of them do, then you can leverage this. Um, the problem with a hardware security module is that it is a physical device which you must put in a data center. Now, cloud providers offer cloud HSMs. So Amazon, Google, and I think Azure have cloud HSM products where you use their HSM or you can ship them one and they'll put it in the data center for you. Um, those HSMs have APIs and therefore they can integrate with the KMS provider plugin. So instead of it being a KMS plugin, it's an HSM plugin, but it's the same API, the same model. And in fact, on Google Cloud, the way that you uh, interact with HSMs on Google Cloud is via the KMS API. HSM is just a different type of key. So you specify whether the key is software or hardware. <clears throat> so that KMS plugin that I showed for Google Cloud actually works with hardware security modules out of the box. You don't have to do anything else. Um, now, if you're on premise, if you're running your own Kubernetes cluster, you would need to write your own plugin or see if the community has written a plugin that works with your particular model of HSM. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. Anything else? Go in once. Go in twice. All right, I'll be around the rest of the event. If you all have any questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter or come up to me afterwards. Thank you all so much.